hopefully we will be able to do that um, later this next coming year. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Fort Worth. Thank you everyone in person for being here. Welcome to everybody online watching on Zoom. We miss you, we love you, we hope you're safe. We hope to see you back here. And the Horizon Room is getting fuller and fuller. It makes me so happy to see everybody here in person. Folks, we got a great one today for you. We have Fox 4 chief meteorologist and published author. He's just released his second book, Dan Henry, who you'll hear from very soon. To get us started, please help me welcome Tom Sturdivant, president of Sturdivant Capital Inc. for our invocation. Tom. Oh, oh, Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are thankful for our many blessings. Forgive us when we sometimes forget that our country is one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. We also forget sometimes that we are called to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. We pray that our president and his cabinet members will look to thee for guidance and strength and will be influenced by you in all the important decisions they have to make. We pray for peace, and may we be respectful of all persons with whom we come into contact, regardless of their, of their race, religious, religion, or ethnicity. We ask all of this in thy holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tom. And special thanks to John Philip Souza for letting us use that national anthem royalty free. It's the gift that keeps on giving. All right, a new tradition we started as of last week is, uh, you know, the, the rotary four-way test is the foundation of what we believe in the things that we think, we say, or do. So all you Rotarians and any guests and anyone watching online, if you'll repeat or say it with me, the rotary four-way test. Number one, is it the truth? Number two, is it fair to all concern? Number three, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And number four, will it be beneficial to all concern? Thank you very much. You know, one of the great honors that I have serving as your president is uh, I get to attend different events in the community uh, and represent this club. And one of the ones I went to actually happened just this morning. We did a quick uh, photo shop job and we put a couple of pictures up. I had the honor of attending the Fort Worth Police Academy uh, graduation. There were 25 graduates, and as you all know, we always honor the top grad with a plaque and a cash award. That will happen sometime in the fall. The top grad was Officer Andres Torres, who gave an amazing speech. It was really an awesome uh, presentation. And you know, when you think about it, regardless of how you feel about the police at this very moment, these officers signed up in January to go through training. And as you can imagine, the world was a very different place in January. So we look forward to having the top grad and the, and the police chief come so we can do that in person. You can meet them, you can shake their hands, and you can thank them for their service. All right, to help us out welcoming visiting Rotarians and guests, please help me welcome Carol Del Real, Executive Director of the Vincent Genovese Memorial Foundation. Carol? Hello, everybody. 
so welcoming to be just to get to welcome everybody here and in Zoom land. Thank you for the guests joining us on Zoom as well. Okay, the first guest is a very special guest. She's actually my daughter, Audrey Delbriel from Bay City, Michigan. Okay, would also like to welcome Aaron Shutt, guest of Jonathan Berry. Donna and James Harvey, guest of Ann Sheets. Dan, uh, oh, Steve Montgomery, guest of Rebecca Montgomery. And Dan Henry, our speaker. Welcome, thank you for being here. And Stephanie Holland. Hi, welcome. Thank you, Carol. Now for the, oh, and also by the way, for anyone on Zoom who is a guest, please type in the chat who you're a guest of and we just thank you for being here and being a part of our Rotary meeting today. Now the moments that some of you have been waiting for. We have the newscast brought to us by a newscast veteran so please help me give the Rotary Newscast welcome to Kathy Neese Brown, Vice President of Mission Support for the James L. West Center. Kathy. Here we go. I'm going to try to do it without my glasses, but with a mask. So uh, while, I, thank you. <laughs> while I have the podium, let me say a personal thank you to my Rotary colleagues. As many of you know, I work in long-term care advocating for persons and families impacted by dementia-related illness. The last seven months have been physically and mentally exhausting. For the calls that I have missed, I send my apologies. And for the notes sent, thank you so much. Working in the sector is a privilege, and today I deliver the newscast wearing an N95 mask as we continue to work on site, praying for a hedge of protection and always with an abundance of caution. Please let me know if you cannot hear me well. As I wrote today's newscast, I realized that my desire to stay informed is at war with my desire to stay sane. Tom, I heard your blessing and I was listening. Please forgive me for today's newscast. I read that 97% of the world's population is stupid, but luckily I'm in the other 5%. Last week... Last week, a colleague asked me if I had plans for the fall. It took me a minute to realize he meant autumn and not the collapse of civilization. <laughs> I just hate wearing a mask. Why do maskers still cuss out non-maskers? After seven months, shouldn't they be dead by now? Wine pouring from water taps in Italy due to a winery spill into a spring? Does Jesus watch out for us during quarantine or what? I read today that alcohol kills 2.5 million people per year. Okay, fine. But think of how many people alcohol produces each year. <laughs> Railhead was right. Life is too short to live in Dallas. The Dallas Chamber of Commerce just released a tourism brochure listing 12 ways to get to Dallas. I'm sorry, but there's only one way to get to Dallas, and that's through a series of terrible personal decisions. <laughs> Sorry if you live in Dallas. <laughs> yeah. In Michigan, a militia was arrested in a plot to kidnap the governor. The hole in their plot was, who would pay to have a politician returned? NASA, I know, NASA is scheduled to put a woman on the moon in 2024. It would have been 2022, but they needed two years to develop an automatic gearbox on the lunar rover. NASA says President Trump is serious about his plan to put a woman on the moon, and that woman is Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> Pelosi said today she has many arrows in her quiver to use against Donald Trump. He's just been upgraded from Hitler to Custer. Come on. I know. Turning to the elections, let's face it, the biggest problem in this presidential election is that somebody could win. And it looks like Ruth Bader Ginsburg is voting by mail this fall. 
<laughs> the Supreme Court could have the bloodiest vacancy since the Bates Motel. Diane Feinstein attacked Amy Coney Barrett's Catholicism, telling her the dogma lives loudly within you. It sounded like Trump nominated Yoda. Come on. Democrats worry that Amy Coney Barrett is too young. She could live long enough to find Hunter Biden, long enough to see schools back in session, or Lori, Lori Loughlin get out. So, this is a bad one. This is where I apologize to all of you. Amy Coney Barrett is obviously a practicing Catholic, a proud parishioner. She was overheard sharing that the Catholic Church has implemented COVID precautions and will start using contactless credit card machines for the Sunday offering. Everything is nearly in place. All the church needs now are contactless priests. <laughs> I'm Episcopal. I'm sorry, Cap Carlo. Okay. CNN was outraged over Walter Reed's weekend tableau, three days thought to be dead, then he emerges and ascends into the sky. Happy Easter. Did you get it? Okay, good. I think we can all agree that President Trump had just had the craziest week since whatever the heck happened last week. I know. Hillary Clinton just sent President Trump a nice card that read, stay positive. <laughs> I'm almost done. Every country in the world, I know, every country in the world has a coronavirus now, but China got it right off the bat. <laughs> right? Yeah. President Trump was just voted America's favorite Chinese takeout. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. It looks like the presidential election is shaping up to be a tight race between the Russians and the Chinese. <laughs> Politicians are being impacted by COVID at an alarming rate. Biden tested negative. It's presumed that he may still have immunity from the Spanish flu of 1918, the plague year of 1665, or the Black Death of 1350. <laughs> Last week's debate was such a bar fight, it seemed as though it was staged on the balcony of the Muppet Theater. The Latin phrase for the debate is potus interruptus. For the next round, they've asked Don King to promote the event. It's already labeled the Thrilla and Vanilla. <laughs> Yeah, thank you again for your grace and support. Stay safe and know that each of you is appreciated so very much. That's the news. Great job, Kathy. If you don't know, we are um, equal opportunity offenders here at Rotary Club. So I think we took a shot at everybody. Thank you, Kathy, for that. All right, to continue with the feel good stories, let me welcome uh, Mac. Kimball, he's president of Kimball Properties. He's going to tell you about a volunteer community outreach event that we just did last Wednesday, and we've got some pictures to show you. Mac? I always say to people, if you're not having a great time in Rotary, you're doing it wrong. Um, Rotary is, is just such a blast, but of course, it's really about building, it's, it's really about building relationships and friendships that last a lifetime. I've traveled all over the world with Rotary and had a great time and nothing felt better than what we did this week in feeding the group. Do we have a couple of photographs there? Um, I gotta tell you, I, I got a chance to stand at the head of the line and send cars to the left line or the right line. And as people came by, some of them had tears in their eyes thanking us for helping them to eat. All we did was hand out food. Someone else did the vast majority of the work. So I got to stand around with Carlo and Sean and have a great time visiting with my friends in Rotary and handing out food to people in need. It was an amazing opportunity. I hope that each of you will try to find out whatever it is that you feel in your heart, whether it's wheelchairs or food or helping kids learn, Rotary does it all. There's nothing, there's no charity on the planet that Rotary doesn't have a finger somewhere nearby. So try to, try to find your outlet, your, your area of service, and then call Carlo and have him come help you because Carlo actually brought food to this last meeting for us. <laughs> so we had a great time. I hope you'll all reach out. I hope you'll find your, your service avenue in Rotary and have a great time and don't do it wrong. Make a lot of friends. Thank you, Mac. I have to say two, two things, right? As I was driving up to park to volunteer, I thought there was an accident because there was a line of cars literally half, I, I counted, it was half a mile long to get to the Wells Fargo Bank parking lot where we did the food distribution. And I pulled in and I realized that every single one of those cars was waiting to get food. We served um, 
550 families from, I mean, from six to eight, we were just nonstop. So we will have more opportunities to do this. It was a lot of fun and special uh, attention to Sean Snell. She changed into her food distribution stiletto high heels. So um, I just want to thank you for that. And a footnote, she can squat 500 pounds. So thank you very much, Sean, for your talents. All right, another feel good story. We've got, as you, many of you know, we started this Circle the Wagons program and it was initially to help minority owned businesses that had been disproportionately affected during COVID. And so what we thought we would do is we would bring it home and bring it into one of our rotary owned businesses. This is the cookery. It's owned by Kelly Gillig. Kelly, will you wave? So the cookery, it's really cool. If, um, if you've ever gotten together with a group and, and made a meal together, right? Whether it's pasta or sushi, that's what Kelly does. She's got commercial kitchen. She's an expert in teaching people how to cook. And Kelly, what's your most popular class that people sign up for? So Kelly and I have talked, of course, being in the food business is very difficult right now. They predict that 25% of all restaurants in Texas could be closed by February. So please, if you're interested in doing something fun, a development opportunity with your staff, please contact Kelly. I'll send an email out with more information. But listen, with classes like Evening in Paris, Pasta Perfecto, Passage to India, Taste of Tuscany, Sushi, they are, she wanted me to mention this too, they are Zagat rated as one of the top 10 date night destinations in the state of Texas. I think right after axe throwing. So <laughs> congratulations to Kelly for that. And let's all support her. I'll send more information over the weekend. And thank you, Kelly. We wish you the best. And we're going to do our best to support you. All right. Now, please help me welcome to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Michael Herman, Chief Operating Officer of Whitley Penn. Thank you, President Carlos. Our speaker today is a gentleman named Dan Henry, is the chief meteorologist for Fox 4 in, the, in Dallas, uh, where he leads a team of five talented meteorologists who deliver daily weather forecasts and provide continuous live coverage during severe weather outbreaks. Uh, in the nation's fifth largest TV market and growing and largest metropolitan area in Tornado Alley. Uh, Dan started his career with the Techniques Development Lab, a branch of the National Weather Service, and I learned in Washington, D.C. is where he did this, uh, developing computer model-based statistical guidance for weather forecasting. From there, uh, he made the jump to television, beginning uh, his broadcasting career with uh, WECT TV in Wilmington, North Carolina, in 1990. Uh, Dan is a five time Emmy award winning certified broadcast meteorologist with 30 years of on air experience. His broadcast experience includes nearly 10 years of environmental and science reporting, live coverage of many tornado outbreaks, on location reporting during several notable hurricanes, including hurricanes Bonnie, Fran, Floyd, and Opal, and writing, producing, hosting numerous severe weather specials and stories. Dan, it's all yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I, uh, I am, it's a privilege and an honor to be here. I've actually never been in this building before. Been in Fort Worth many, many times. Uh, I've um, been in the Dallas-Fort Worth area now for 20 years. I've been uh, broadcasting for 30 years. Uh, my TV career started back in 1990. Um, and I, uh, I got my start, actually, I was a number cruncher in Washington, D.C., kind of parlayed a, an internship from college uh, into a job there and um, knew I always wanted to give television a try, but the big hurdle I had to overcome was I was deathly afraid to do this. I, <laughs> getting in front of groups of people and speaking uh, was, was terrifying to me, uh, but I had made a couple of, um, of demo tapes 
And the only TV meteorology course that I took at Penn State, um, they don't they don't train us to be television meteorologists. They 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 train us to be forecasters for the National Weather Service or to go on and get advanced degrees and and do research and crunch more numbers. Um, but I didn't really want to do that. I, I wanted to, to to give television a try. Um, and uh, I got a job offer. I was literally sitting in my office in Washington, D.C. one day. And um, I, I got a call from Rayford Brown was his name, news director down in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, Southern gentleman. And um, he was very brutally honest with me on the phone. Uh, he says, Dan, your tape is awful. Um, <laughs> he says, you are green beyond belief, but my, my chief meteorologist here sees some potential. So we're going to bring you down for an interview. Went down and I, I did the interview and I guess... I, I may have impressed him just enough to get a, to get a job offer in a 90 day contract. <laughs> $500 moving expenses, making about $13,000 a year. That was back in 1990. And even back then that was not a lot of money. Um, but um, I got about halfway through that contract and I was struggling. I mean, I, it was deer in the headlights. I mean, I burned all those tapes the first month, two months I was on the air. It was really bad. My suits were three times too big for me. Um, and um, But I remember him bringing me in his office one day, and I thought it was going to be a friendly chat, but he was, he was, he said, Dan, I don't know if you're going to make it. He says, uh, I mean, that 90-day contract expires in 45 days, and, um, you know, there's no guarantees after that. He says, you just – you look uncomfortable out there. You look you look like you need a couple martinis before you go on the air. Maybe you're you saying I should try that? I think he was really serious. Maybe take your shoes off. I knew somebody that that was very nervous like you were, and they took their shoes off, and that made him feel. Fortunately, um, about I say fortunately, uh, a couple of weeks before the end of my contract expired, we had a hurricane. Um, and uh, we had to go into literally 24-7 uh, coverage, and it was myself and Jeff. There was literally two of us at the station. So we were rotating 12 hours on, 12 hours off. And I think it was just the repetition. It was that all that extra on-air time that, that finally got me comfortable and uh, earned me another contract, thankfully, after that. But um, that was 30 years ago. And I, I just I feel very blessed and privileged and honored to do what I do. I really do. Um, you know, weather drives, you know, local news. I, I appreciated the, the newscast, by the way. It was very funny. Um, <laughs> sometimes I feel like our uh, nightly newscasts uh, are a little unbelievable. Um, but um, I, I, I pride myself in, in what I do. I think what we do is extremely important. I mean, uh, this this is one of the more most dynamic areas in the country for weather. I mean, we can literally see four seasons in a couple days here in North Texas. It changes that quickly. Um, and, and there's a reason for that. And that's, that's geography. It's where we are. We are in the Southern Plains. It is wide open from here all the way to Canada. So we get those cold air masses that, that can come plowing right on down I-35 and in a matter of hours, we can see temperatures drop 50 degrees in less than 24 hours with an Arctic cold front. Um, but we are also uniquely positioned with our neighbor to the south, the Gulf of Mexico. So southerly winds are blowing here all the time, blowing in a lot of moisture. Um, and so you get these, these collisions of, of air masses here. Uh, and then you combine storms that roll in from the west. And, and boy, we can we can get some some fierce weather here um and anybody that's been here now for the last five years knows that you need to be on your toes all the time i mean it's been beautiful here for the last couple of weeks but uh it was almost a year ago october 20th 2019 that we had that terrible tornado hit dallas and i remember it distinctly coming out of the home depot in south lake um six o'clock now let me, let me set the stage here for you. We had the Fort Worth Air Show that weekend. It was the closing weekend of the state fair. Uh, 
It was beautiful. I mean, both days were gorgeous, very warm. Um, and I don't think people's minds were on weather at all. Um, they were focused on, on having a good time, enjoying the weather. And, and quite frankly, I, I was too. I mean, we, we were forecasting a threat of severe weather on that Friday. Um, but, you know, you get involved in your weekend and you, you kind of tend to, to lose sight of that. Um, it's when I stepped out of that Home Depot at six o'clock on Sunday evening and looked off to the southwest and saw those huge billowing clouds. And I knew, OK, <laughs> we've got something brewing really quickly. And I looked at my phone, looked at the radar. Um, and so I, I, I called our meteorologist, Ali Turiano, who is uh, our weekend meteorologist, still is. And said, Ali, I said, you're going to need some help tonight. She said, oh, I think I got it. And I, I just had this bad feeling uh, that, that I needed to get in there. And so I went in and for the first hour, um, things were behaving pretty well. We had storms that were moving into Tarrant County, into Johnson County, 60 mile an hour winds, quarter sized hail, not a real big deal. Um, of course, there was something else going on that night. Cowboys Eagles game. Um, huge playoff implications. I'm a huge sports fan, by the way. Um, and, um, so we knew that that was kind of a blessing and, and a curse at the same time. I mean, it was a blessing and that a lot of people were going to be inside and not outside watching the game, but a lot of people were going to be watching the game and really not dialed into what was going on with the weather. And as those storms rolled towards Dallas County, it, it was just a little subtle difference in the winds, a little more low-level wind shear that literally got that storm rotating big time. Um, and a tornado warning went out right before 9 o'clock, right before we're going on the air. Um, and you want to talk about one of those kind of those worst case scenarios that, that you can paint. Um, but here's a storm that, that was going to produce a tornado just west of I-35, move over I-35, move over the tollway, um, you know, Preston, Hillcrest, highly populated areas of North Dallas, uh, then head towards the High Five. Um, I mean, neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood. Um, and we knew that when we were on the air, uh, following this storm, it was on the ground for almost 20 miles, um, powerful storm. Um, and I don't know if you've seen the damage, but it was, it was extraordinary. Um, and it's just a reminder that, you know, as we got a reminder back in 2000 here in Fort Worth, um, that, that tornadoes can hit downtown areas and highly populated areas. Um, but that was also, it, it, it was a lesson in, in a number of different things, that tornado that hit, uh, back in, in October, it, it, um, the tornado sirens went off and they were on for a few minutes. Um, and then they went off. And so people heard the tornado sirens, but they also heard them go off. And so they figured the threat was over with. Um, and then, and I, we, Stephanie Holen, by the way, I need to introduce her. She's my attorney and publicist. She's, she's been a wonderful partner in this, in this two year, you know, process of writing this book. Um, she's had some amazing ideas that I've incorporated in the book, but she and I toured the tornado, uh, damaged neighborhoods around St. Mark's in, in North Dallas after this. And we talked to a lot of people. We wanted to ask them. You know, what was going on that night? Why, why is it that, you know, that you were literally running at the last second for, for shelter? Well, number one, people were watching the game, so they really weren't paying attention. But they were also, they, they heard the sirens go off, but the sirens then ended and things got really eerily still and quiet. Um, and then they remember the power going out. And then once the power went out, literally seconds later, it's like, this, this wind engine and the winds went from zero to 150 in a matter of seconds and all heck started breaking loose. And many people were literally on their couches watching their televisions and their roofs are peeling away and, and, and exterior walls are crumbling as they are, what in the world is going on? And they're running, literally grabbing kids, pets, whatever they can 
and heading for the bathroom, the closet to take shelter. And we were told this story time and time again. Um, and I think it's just a lesson that we all, we all need to be dialed in. You know, the, the last two major outbreaks we've had now, October 20th, out of season, day after Christmas, 2015. Another case in point where it's, it doesn't have to be March, April, or May, our prime tornado season for us to get hit with, with potentially deadly weather. Um, and so we always, we always need to be, to be, uh, to be dialed in. Um, I think I've got my, uh, my PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to try to go through this very quickly if I can. Um, wrote this book, uh, Menacing Skies is the name of it, Texas Weather and Stories of Survival. And when I set out to write this book, I wanted, I wanted to include, obviously, the science. I wanted people to know what causes lightning. Why is it that, that, that some storms produce tornadoes and some don't? How can we get baseball and softball size sale? I wanted to answer all those questions, but I also wanted to include stories from real people like you and me that have been in nature's worst and have survived it. And boy, I, I can't tell you, I mean, that, that was such a privilege to be able to talk to these people that have survived storms like that. That's the tornado that hit the day after Christmas, 2015, um, tragically claimed the lives of 13 people, but there were literally hundreds and hundreds of homes uh, that, were, that were damaged, severely damaged by that uh, tornado. Um, and what I learned in talking with these, with these survivors of these storms is that PTSD is a real thing when it comes to surviving weather like this, because your life literally, it, it's never the same after a tornado or after a devastating flash flood. Um, my favorite interview in the entire book, and it's about halfway through, is with uh, a man by the name of Richard Laver. Now, any of you that are tennis fans, have you ever heard of Rod Laver? Rod Laver, his first cousin, Ian Laver, was Richard's father. Um, so Richard and his, and his father, Ian, uh, were on a plane that uh, left Fort Lauderdale, Florida, back in 1985, flying on the way to L.A. by way of DFW. Um, that plane on the approach to DFW encountered a pretty fierce thunderstorm. And um, Richard, who was 12 years old at the time, um, was scared the night before, the day before. He didn't want to get, he had this premonition that something bad was going to happen. And his mom tried the best she could to reassure him that, you know, son, you've flown many times. There's nothing to worry about. Well, sure enough, I mean, they get on this flight and they encounter this storm and it was extremely turbulent. Um, he got up out of his seat, went to the bathroom, splashed cold water in his face and got back to his seat and purposely didn't put his seatbelt on. Um, that saved his life. I'm not advocating for not wearing a seatbelt on an aircraft. But what end, ended up happening is that plane hit a thunderstorm and hit wind shear. And in 1985, we didn't know a whole lot about wind shear and the dangers to aviation, in particular taking off and landing. And if you're familiar with 114, Highway 114, there's a lot of hotels and, and you know, huge warehouses now. And a lot of that stuff wasn't there at the time. This plane... And a lot of what's neat is a lot of this is online. I mean, you can literally Google in the flight data recorder, you know, word by word, it, it, you can read what the pilots were talking about and what they were encountering as they were flying into the storm. The plane ended up going down in the field at 200 miles an hour, barreling across the field towards Highway 114, Right wing clips three huge light standards. It ends up crushing a car on 114. The plane is still intact. The right, the right engine is on fire. Um, they're heading towards the runway, and then the left wing clips those two huge water tanks. And at that point in time, from row 33 to the cockpit, literally explodes um, in a fireball. Richard is ejected. He is in row 34. There's nothing left of the aircraft from row 33 to the front, nothing. 
if you've seen some of the photos, and I've got a photo in the book, um, the charred, you know, rear portion of that aircraft. Uh, let me see if I can find that here. Um, it, it's there's. I'll talk about that too coming up. Um, there it is. That was all that was left of the aircraft. That is little Richard. That's his father, Ian. Ian did not survive. Richard was the only survivor in that row. He was one of the only survivors on the aircraft. He's ejected through a fireball. He lands in the field. He nearly drowns because remember, the left wing slices open those two huge water tanks. They're spilling thousands of gallons of water into the field. He's face down in there. Passersby are stopping on 114. He's pulled out. He spends the next three weeks in the burn unit at, uh, at a hospital uh, in Dallas, um, Parkland. And he survives, but for the next 15 years, he's this vagabond. He's literally just, just running ambly through life. He, he is, he's petrified to fly every time he hears. Uh, long story short, um, his life starts to come together. He meets a woman, they get married, they have a child um, who's very, very sick, very ill. Um, and I won't give away all the details in it, but the, 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 the story that he tells about he, how he pieces his life back together, it's amazing. Um, and eventually you'll find out um, through this that uh, he becomes a very, very successful businessman. He, he, he founds a multi-million dollar company called Kate's Farms uh, that uh, produces nutritional shakes all over the country. Um, but I remember distinctly when, when I'm talking with him during the phone, there was, there was times when he said, are you still there? I'm like, yeah, I'm just, I can't believe what you're telling me. But, but that's what I wanted to do with this book is I not only wanted to tell people about the science of meteorology, um, but I wanted to share these incredible stories of survival um, with, with the reader. Uh, and that's just one of them. If you're into history, um, it, it's in the book too. The 57 Dallas tornado um, hit on a, on a day when thousands of people were able to see it. And this, this, there were many, many hundreds of photographs, um, film that was shot of this. It was the first tornado, literally, that was able to be studied from birth to the end of it, this entire life cycle through pictures and film. And meteorologists took the next three years and they studied literally every section of film, all these photographs, and they did an amazing job um, researching that tornado. Um, of course, I talk about floods, the 1949 flood here in Fort Worth. Um, you know, downtown Fort Worth was under several feet of water. It's back before we had, you know, the levee system that we do now and, and the flood control, the stormwater control measures that we have nowadays. Uh, let's see, not clicking here. I'll go to the, if you're into uh, storm chasing, uh, I talk a lot about severe weather research uh, in the book. Um, I interviewed a guy by the name of Tim Samaris. Tim and his son uh, and their chase partner were out El Reno, Oklahoma several years ago. That was that fateful day that all three of them lost their lives chasing uh, that particular tornado. It was a near EF5 tornado with 250 mile an hour winds. Um, the tornado grew from maybe a third of a mile wide to almost two and a half miles wide. At times it was stationary and then it would speed up to 40 miles an hour. Uh, it took an abrupt easterly turn, then an abrupt northerly turn. Um, it was one of those storms that did everything that you did not expect it to do that day. And it caught a, a lot of storm chasers off guard. Um, and we're lucky that only three perished, but Tim was a pioneer in severe weather research. And they would launch what were called tornado probes. And their job was to get as close as they could to the tornado, put these probes down on the ground. They were filled with instruments that measured temperature and pressure and humidity and even had high resolution cameras inside. And he had this uncanny ability of placing these. He had many direct hits. Um, on this day though, they misjudged 
how close they were to this tornado and they got swept up in it. They, they concluded afterwards that this tornado, the parent tornado, also had these satellite tornadoes that were rotating around it at 200 miles an hour. So they were literally hit by a satellite tornado at 200 miles an hour and it, their car was, was catapulted about a third of a mile. Um, and it was, yeah. But the research that we continue to do today to study these things, to get close, and that's a Doppler's on wheel, uh, a Doppler on wheels, uh, that uh, enables us to probe the storms and look inside, peer inside these storms um, and get information about what the winds are doing and also to sample the atmosphere around these storms that produce these, these tornadoes. Um, I could go on here a lot, um, there's, there's, uh, but I'd like to open this up now to questions from you uh, about you know, the book or what I do on television. Yeah, we'll start with, with you. So he asked, do I have a storm shelter in my house? I do not, uh, but I, I, if you read the book, I, I am a pretty big advocate of storm shelters. Um, and, you know, obviously you can spend as little as maybe $3,500, $4,000 to upwards of $15,000 or more, um, but it's important that that storm shelter has the certification, and many of them do, um, and a lot of the certification is, is done through the Wind Institute uh, out at uh, Texas Tech in, in Lubbock, uh, where they actually test uh, these things in the laboratory. Uh, and they'll fire two by fours at, at well over 100 miles an hour at the exterior shell of these things to make sure that they are indeed, um, you know, wind resistant or, you know, avoid the impacts. But I don't have one, but I think everybody should be familiar with their home, very familiar, and have a plan in place as to where to go and, and where, you know, where the, the most, the safest place is in your home. Is it an interior closet? Is it the pantry maybe beneath the stairs? Um, and and um, you will be safe 99 times out of 100 um, in, in the, in the, in fact, let me tell you a quick story here. Um, back in 1995, they sent me out to do a story uh, in the wake of a tornado in, in Dallas. So I go out to this neighborhood and there's an elderly woman. She's 75 years old, 80 years old. I say that now. She's, I'm, 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 I'm getting there pretty quickly myself. <laughs> um, but she's, it, it's, it's kind of a sad scene. You see it play out all the time. She's sifting through the debris in, in her yard. Not a scratch on her, nothing. And I asked her, I said, ma'am, I said, were you in your home when the tornado hit? She says, yes, I was. I said, where were you? Well, she says, follow me. I'll, I'll. So my photographer and I, I mean, there's broken glass, there's brick. I mean, the walls had collapsed. There's The roof is gone. We get to the middle of what used to be her home and it's her bedroom closet. That's literally one of the only things standing. We open the closet door. The clothes are still hanging exactly where they were before the storm. The, she had shoe boxes that are piled up the lids are still on, nothing's out of place, nothing. So that's why we tell people, you go to an interior portion, lowest floor available, away from exterior walls or windows, a bathroom, a closet, if you can grab something to put over your head, um, bicycle helmets, we store those, store those in your, in your tornado shelter, in that closet, that'll provide you with head protection in case you do lose your roof and you're subject to, to, to flying debris. Uh, climate change. That's the, the final chapter in my book. It's probably the, <laughs> I, I, and I didn't bury the lead, um, but I, I, I spent the most time on that. It was an eye-opening chapter to write. I did a tremendous amount of research on it. And I'll be honest, I mean, as of, you know, five years ago, I was on the fence. Um, but the amount of, of evidence, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to ignore. Um, and, you know, where the debate in my mind still lies is what will the potential, you know, implications be? But when you look at all the, the 
when you try to explain it through only natural variations, El Nino, La Nina, changes in, in the orbit of, uh, and, and the tilt of the, uh, the, the Earth's axis towards the sun, Nothing can account for the type of warming that we've seen dating back to the Industrial Revolution. And we've warmed now over, you know, two degrees since then. Um, we measure CO2 levels um, every single day, every minute of the day. The Mauna Loa Obser Observatory uh, in Hawaii, which is 12,000 feet above sea level, which we get precise measurements. And for thousands of years, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere was anywhere from 280 to 320 parts per billion, and it stayed steady for thousands of years. Um, in the last 150 years, we've gone from that 280 to 320 range, we're now at about 425. And it's that, that hockey, so we're on an incline like this. We have computer models uh, that we use every day to forecast the weather. Um, and, and we input them with a tremendous amount of data and observations. We've got global computer models too that we can use to simulate the warming of the atmosphere. And when you plug in all the variables, you plug in El Nino, La Nina, you, you plug in volcanic eruptions, you plug in changes in, in, in the Earth's orbit, the, the you know, changes in the, all the natural stuff, nothing accounts for that warming until you plug in CO2. And then when you plug in the CO2, then we can account for the warming that we've seen over the last, you know, 100 years or so. So yes, I do believe that, that um, burning of fossil fuels uh, has, has led to, you know, to climate change. Um, I think we gotta be careful though. You can't blame singular weather events on climate change. We get a, a fierce hurricane and all of a sudden we wanna blame climate change. Um, I tend to believe too that, that especially hurricane activity, and we're seeing Delta right now, we're seeing an incredibly active season, but it's very cyclical. In the 50s and 60s, it was a very, very active period of time. And then things settled down. Um, so there are natural variations in our weather patterns as well. Um, but I, I, I do believe that, that climate change is real um, and that our planet is warming um, and, and, and that, that it's gonna continue unless there are um, measures that are taking place to cut back on the burning of, of those fossil fuels and you know, the CO2 levels. My daughter recently, she lives in Mexico and she rode through uh, Delta just a couple of days ago. My question is, what does barometric pressure, they say the lower it goes, the more fierce is the hurricane. And then why are the, the wind, I don't know what you call it, the bands around the hurricane, why is the winds more strong in one particular area? So um, <clears throat> hurricanes feed off of, of very warm water uh, and, and the evaporation of moisture from the ocean. Um, and with, with a hurricane, it's like an atmospheric engine. So it feeds on that warm water. Um, and as the pressure drops, um, in the center, and the pressure, the reason the pressure is dropping is because the air is rising. All this, this very warm air is rising. And to replace that, you, you have to bring in wind from the surrounding area. So wind converges in. And as the wind converges in towards the center, it's like the, the spinning skater in angular momentum. And so as it gets closer and closer to the center, it spins faster and faster. Um, and so a hurricane basically has an eye, kind of a clear area in the middle. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. Um, it can be obscured by clouds, but surrounding that eye is a ring of very, very intense weather, the eye wall. That is where you see the really, really intense wind and rain. Um, when the hurricane hunters fly into hurricanes, they fly right into the eye and they usually do like a clover leaf pattern. Um, they'll go right through, they'll, they'll hang a, it's like kind of doing a clover leaf on a highway, they'll come right back, do another one. But when they get in that eye, it's like a, the stadium effect is what they call it because they are surrounded literally by thousands of foot walls of thunderstorms all around them. And it's like being in a stadium, except it's not fans, it's fierce thunderstorms <laughs> that you have to go right through again. 
Um, but some of those outermost spiral rain bands too um, can have very, very intense weather as well. Um, Delta right now is it's going to make landfall late this afternoon, more than likely southwestern Louisiana, which is uh, this will be, I think, the fourth hit for Louisiana this season. Just unbelievable. Um, we'll probably barely see anything from Delta at all. Our eastern counties, you know, today may see a few of the outermost rain bands. We'll probably not get a drop of rain across. I think I had a 10 to 20 percent chance of rain here. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been an unbelievable, you know, season so far. Yeah, sure. Real quick, um, Jason Ray wants to know, do you have any superstitions related to weather? And then Mike <laughs> Taylor wants to know, please comment on the melting of our glaciers. You got about six Wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> superstitions. Um, you know, not really. Uh, I don't have any superstitions. There is, and this will be, Stephanie, um, gave me the idea. She's like, why don't you put QR codes in the book? I'm like, what's a QR code? Well, we've learned what QR codes now are through COVID. You go to a restaurant, you scan the code, it brings up the menu. There's an unbelievable, now uh, all these QR codes are in the book and you can scan them. And I also wanted to make this book interactive, but there's one in the climate change uh, chapter where you scan this, this code and it brings up this video, there were these researchers that are literally sitting on the Greenland ice sheet. They've been sitting there for two weeks watching an iceberg and nothing was happening. So they're reporting back to, you know, and they report every day, nothing's happened, nothing's going on. Well, the video that I share, they, they make their call in and I'm like, well, hold on a second, something is actually happening. They literally watch an iceberg three times the size of Manhattan break apart. It's called glacier calving, and it breaks apart before their eyes. Um, it's, it's a mesmerizing three and a half to four minute video, but that's kind of part of, of, of climate change. I mean, we are, there's, a, there's a, a comparison, a before and after photo of the Muir Glacier in Alaska from comparing 1942 to present day it's receded over 30 miles. Uh, so, but so I'm gonna give this over to Stephanie right now since I asked her my last question. She's my attorney and publicist. She's been uh, incredibly helpful with this book. Um, so let me give you to Stephanie. I get to do this every time he's on stage. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> he would talk about it all day and I can promise you there really aren't superstitions because I'm around it all the time. So first I wanted to tell you, he just barely touched on it. That ice calving thing, if you've ever seen the way that crystals grow, it looks like that, but it's Manhattan three times and it just keeps falling. And it's mesmerizing. It looks like one of those little I spy things. So throughout the book, there are QR codes. So you actually get to see a lot of the tornadoes that he's got in here. And so while you're reading it, you put your phone over it and you can pull up the video and see what effect you're reading about while it's happening. So that makes the book a little bit more interactive. And so he does do a lot of those personal stories. One of the other things that I wanna say in this, cause I'm the lawyer and I get to be the boring one. Um, a lot of times when we were talking to people, one of the things that he talked about was hearing that people were like, oh, well the sirens went off. The other thing that I heard was, well, we heard that it was over at Love Field, so we didn't worry about it. Guys, this is on Walnut Hill. We're, we're not that far, maybe two and a half, three miles. And they were like, oh, well, it went off, so I wasn't listening anymore. If you ever hear them, listen, hide. I mean, we saw a wall that's about the size of this back wall, and their entire house was glass windows. It was completely spiderwebbed. Her teenage son was walking across the backyard when it hit. The tree that was there is gone. So if you ever hear them, waste 15 minutes and hide. Like, just be safe. And so the other thing I wanted to say before I talk about the fact that he's going to be signing his books and they're set up back there if you'd like a signed copy is that, because I'm the publicist, so I get to shamelessly plug, is that legally speaking, one of the things that I see that happens a lot of times in storms is that especially um, our older family members and everything don't keep their paperwork and their insurance and things in places. So when a storm comes through and it rips their house from where it is, or it gets hit by a hurricane or there's a flood, a lot of the hospital records were lost in Katrina. If you can, or you can help your family members, scan those in and keep it on a USB. Cause that USB can be in your glove compartment or it can be on your keychain. 
because those papers, those insurance documents are what's going to help you start putting your life together after these storms hit. So I'm done with the boring part. There's a table set up right there. He'll be available for signing. He does have another call at 115, so not to rush you, but I'm going to have to rush him at 115. So thank you for having us here today. I hope you have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you guys very much, Dan. I think we all knew before you spoke that you were a, a world-class meteorologist, but boy, you are a heck of a storyteller. That was really outstanding. It is the tradition of the Rotary Club of Fort Worth to give a book to the Fort Worth Public Library in your honor. And we have a copy of the book plate that will go into the book. Dan, thank you. That was mesmerizing. Thank you so much. Give another hand for Dan. Thank you. Boy, that was great. A couple closing announcements so we can get you out of here on time is that uh, if you're interested in sponsoring one of these meetings, we know we had 45 people online, about 60, so about 100 folks here. Rotary, of course, is made up of business executives, nonprofit leaders, and community stakeholders. So we'd love your sponsorship to be highlighted during a meeting. Um, we also have, interesting enough, uh, October 15th, we are celebrating the USS uh, Fort Worth's anniversary at the Riata. If you're interested, go to ussfortworth.org to sign up. It will be a very good time. Next week, we have an, aw an awesome speaker, Dr. Robert Lawson. I'm going to tell you about what he's going to talk about, socialism and world economic freedom. So bring all your dollars. We'll distribute them evenly, and we can start the meeting. <laughs> Seriously, he is, um, he is a, a professor at SMU. He directs the O'Neill Center for Global Markets the freedom at the SMU Cox School of Business. And uh, he is also the co-author of an Amazon bestseller. And get this, it's called Socialism Sucks. Two, I'm not making this up. Two economists drink their way through the unfree world. Sounds like a peer-reviewed publication. So he'll be here next week. Don't miss that. If you're interested, be sure and contact Aurora for details to get your food count and chair count. And uh, I think on a couple slides later, we have... I'll give these final announcements. Rotary Blood Drive, uh, October 22nd. I'll email you all with more information about that. And pedaling for polio. If you would like to spend 30 minutes on a stationary bike helping us raise money for polio, we'll be doing it at a, a, the Northeast YMCA. Let me know. Spandex optional. And finally, we will be moving offices. So if you're a Red Badger or you would have time to help today right after this meeting, We'll need maybe an hour of your time. You can meet us in the Rotary office. It's 715, these nearest elevators down to the se uh, seventh floor. And uh, I'd like to also thank Luke Jordan and Nathan Schneiderman. They are the team behind the camera. Um, Luke Jordan is Chris Jordan's son. Chris has the week off. So Luke, thank you so much. And a hand for Luke and Nathan for helping. And to end, we're going to, through the magic of Zoom, we're going to try and pull over our friends that are watching online. I see 41 of you online, so we can all wave and thank you and say hello. I see Fernando Costa, Sylvia Mahoney, uh, Tran Trong. There's a bunch of y'all there. So everybody give them a good wave. There's Wesley Janel. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody online. We miss you. We love you. Stay safe. And we hope to see you in person soon. Meeting adjourned. <laughs> it's it's cold. <COVID. laughs>